Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food Revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have part one of two of our interview with Tom Spellman of Dave Wilson Nursery to talk about fruit trees and urban orchards. Tom has been involved in the nursery business since 1973. At that time, he was a freshman in high school and rode his skateboard to work. How fun is that? Since then, he has worked for several different nurseries, including Nogales Nursery, where he learned landscape design, installation, irrigation, and construction. Armstrong Nurseries, where he worked with hybridizers, growers, and retail on the weekends. Laverne Nursery, which specializes in avocado, citrus, subtropical fruits, and grafted ornamentals, where he was general manager for 20 years, and currently Southwestern sales manager for Dave Wilson Nursery. Dave Wilson Nursery is the largest grower of fruit, nut, and shade trees in the USA. They grow 10.5 million trees per year and ship wholesale worldwide. Over the past 20 years, Tom has also done television, radio, video, written and conducted workshops and lectured on the concepts of backyard orchard culture and fruit growing in general. Tom's dedication and passion for quality fruit growing has taken him to dozens of states in the U.S. as well as several countries around the globe to consult and lecture on fruit trees and fruit growing concepts. Welcome to the show today, Tom. Greg, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, it, you know, it's been a wonderful career, and, and I, I have to admit that I'm probably mm, luckier than I am intelligent. I, <laughs> I've had the honor over my 40-year career to work with some real giants in, in the horticultural industry. Yeah. And um, I've had some great mentors, and I've learned a lot along the way, and I'm still learning every day. So it, it's just a, it's a wonderful business. I look forward to getting up and getting started every morning, and I, I just can't even imagine um, anything close to retirement at this time. Uh-huh. Cool. So you're talking about backyard orchard culture. That is different than orchard culture in general, right? Greg, it's completely different. You know, the, the only real similarities are that uh, a commercial farmer and a backyard grower are both growing trees. Oh, yes. But their, their expectations are completely different. Their outlooks are completely different. Uh, methodology is completely different. You know, let's consider a commercial farmer. Uh-huh. A commercial farmer wants to grow an, an acre of peach trees mm-hmm. where each tree is going to produce somewhere between 300 and 400 pounds of fruit. Wow. Now, Peaches ripen up in a fairly short period of time. They're ripe in about a to three week period. So right. let's consider you as a backyard grower. Mm-hmm. Do you want three hundred pounds of peaches in a three week period of time? And if, if you do, what are you gonna do with them? Yeah, no kidding. So backyard growers have a completely different expectation of crop size. Mm-hmm. A commercial grower 
absolutely wants all that fruit to be ripe at one time. They want to go out into the orchard and pick. Uh, of course. Pick of peaches at one time and get them to market and get their paycheck. It's what they do for a living. Right. Where a commercial grower wants a lot of fruit at one time, mm -hmm. a backyard grower wants a little bit of fruit all the time. Oh, yes. So, so you're, you know, you're going to grow, you're not going to grow 10 trees or 5 trees or even 2 trees of the same variety. Uh -huh. You're going to grow multiple varieties that ripen over a successive period of time so that you have a little bit of fruit all season. Right. So and they, they, they call that's one of the three concepts around backyard orchard culture, and that's called successive harvesting, right? Absolutely. Can it's you, probably the most important concept of backyard orchard culture. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Well, it, it, it's just like I explained, you know, where, where a commercial grower wants a lot of fruit at one time, mm -hmm. backyard growers, you know, I, I want a, a, a variety of fruit over the season. I just don't want to eat, you know, peaches all the time. I want right. peaches and plums and nectarines and apricots and... And I want my citrus, and I want my avocados, and I want my subtropical fruits and things uh, as they come into season. So, you know, during each fruit season, uh, stone fruit season, for example, starts uh, as early as mid-April and, mm -hmm. and goes as late as uh, into September. So uh -huh. I can grow a, a few different apricots, a few different plums and peaches, and, and have a little bit of fruit almost every week throughout that growing season. Right. I've actually been working here at the Urban Farm on getting 12 months a year of fruit out of the yard and i think i'm about at nine it takes some work yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely can harvest uh, every single day of the year i can harvest something out of my backyard oh nice nice so what do you harvest in the winter mostly citrus and avocado oh perfect and then in, in the springtime you get the loquats and things like that that come into play and uh-huh and you know, you through the fall, you have your your persimmons and your pomegranates and your apples and oh, yeah. pears and hang on the tree well into winter. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I can always pick something every day. I can go out and pick something. Yeah, nice. For here, for us here in the desert, though, I found that there's a window between say July 10th and like September 15th where it's just too dang hot to grow anything. Oh, and I, and I totally agree and, and see that. You know, you, you're in, you're in a, a climate where it's just not conducive to pick fruit during that hot summer period, mm -hmm. where if you were in uh, Montana, uh -huh. you're not going to be picking anything in the wintertime. You know, you don't oh, have any, right. any variety to grow at that time of year. So it's all going to vary depending on what climate you're in, what zone you're in, you know, what, what your general growing conditions are. But, you know, then again, by... by uh, uh, Supplementing different microclimates by mm -hmm. adding shade, adding a cold frame, by adding a greenhouse. You know, you can always extend those seasons out. Yeah. Would you explain for our listeners what a microclimate is? Well, I think that's something that um, very few people ever take into consideration, and that could be their downfall. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of people that send me emails or give me a phone call and say, hey, I want to grow a peach in zone 10, or I want to grow a a mango in zone nine. You know, what, what, what can you tell me about that? And I, so the first thing I say is, you know, a, a zone is huge. It's, whether it's a USDA zone yep. or a Sunset Western zone, there are, you know, huge, huge expanses of land that make up a zone. And I don't really care what happens on a, on a hundred mile stretch of uh, the California Central Valley. What mm -hmm. matters to me and what matters should, uh, to, to every grower is what happens in your individual microclimate on your piece of property where you're going to be growing. And I guarantee you, everybody thinks that, oh, it's, you know, it's all the same around here, but it's yeah, not. The lay of the land yeah. is different. The, the wind directions and, and wind flows are different. The heat uh, exposures are different. So what you really, really need to do and what people really need to do is they need to get some time and, and, and understand what happens on their piece of property. Yeah. You know, what are your extremes? What's the coldest temperature you're going to get? What's the hottest summer temperature you're going to get? Where are your sunny locations? Where are your shady locations? What's your soil type? You know, do you have good drainage, fair drainage, or poor drainage? Yeah. You know, how, how does your irrigation system work? Does it put on the same amount of water, you know, everywhere? Or is it different in, in different places? So mm -hmm. understanding everything about your piece of property is the first and most important concept to a selection of area for planting yeah if i want to put in um a pomegranate let's say mm -hmm. pomegranates like like the heat they like it dry so i'm going to choose an area that gets good full direct sun in an area that probably doesn't get as much irrigation as a as a lawn area or a vegetable 
So, you know, there's always different considerations for different types of plants. Yeah. And once you understand your microclimate, now you have the information that will uh, allow you to go out and choose the right planting location for everything you want to put in. Perfect. So that's concept number one. Concept number two is really controlling the size of the tree, right? Yeah, I think um, uh, tree size management is a very, very important concept to backyard orchard culture. And it's one that's been controversial over the years. You know, I've really? had people tell me, well, you're telling me how big I can grow my tree. And, and in <laughs> fact, I'm not telling anybody how big they can grow their tree. What I'm telling them is it's easier to maintain a small tree than it is to maintain a big tree. Yeah. If I'm going to pick plums, I want to do it from standing on the ground. I don't want to climb 15 feet up in the air yeah. to pick or thin or prune my plum tree. I want to something where it, it's easy for me to get to that fruit and manage that fruit. So yeah. anything that ripens up over a short period of time, I, I want to be able to manage that crop from crop from the ground. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, here's what I tell people, because I, you know, I run the fruit tree program here at the Urban Farm, and what I tell people is that a, you know, a peach at the top of a 20-foot peach tree is bird food. That's right, that's right. And, so, you know, and then on the other hand, I don't want to tell anybody how big their tree should be. That's uh-huh. their decision. Right. They need to be they need to be the one that decides whether they want a 15-foot plum tree or a 7-foot plum tree. Right. So, you know, I've never told anybody how big they should grow their trees. I tell them decide for yourself what works for you. Choose a size that's manageable for you mm-hmm. and always keep these pruned to that size. Perfect. And how do we so when I get a tree and put it in my yard, how do I keep it small well it, i mean uh, have a very good pair of good sharp pruning shears <laughs> and that's the way you're going to manage your tree and and when the tree becomes too big you take the top out of it uh-huh. and there's always this concern well am i going to lose fruit well you know you're not going to lose any fruit because once you get beyond your chosen size uh-huh. that's wood that you're going to remove once or twice or three times a year uh-huh. to maintain tree size so that's never going to be fruiting wood anyway. Yeah. You're going to maintain your fruit crop down in a lower portion of the tree. And, you know, tree size for me is real variable. If it's a, if it's a peach tree, uh-huh. seven, seven and a half feet is about as big as I want it to get. Right. Now, if it's an avocado tree, a seven-foot tree doesn't give me all the fruit that I want. You know, right. I, I'm in avocado every day, or at least a half an avocado every day, and, you know, so does my wife, and so do my kids and my grandkids and everybody Everybody loves avocados, so if I was only growing a seven-foot avocado tree, I'd be out long before you know <laughs> the the fruit was was gone. So right. uh, for 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 me, a fifteen-foot avocado tree is easy to manage. The fruit hangs on the tree for months, not weeks. Oh uh, yes. So I can go out every Sunday morning and pick eight or ten or twelve fruit or whatever I'm going to need for the week. They're going to soften up, uh-huh. and I go back the next week and I do the same thing again. So. With a, with a 10-foot basket picker, I can easily manage an avocado tree. If I had that in a plum tree, that fruit's all going to ripen up in a short period of time, yep. and and then I'm going to lose it. Then it's all going to hit hit the ground. Yeah. So, Perfect. you know, I, I want to manage varieties that ripen up over a short period, two, three, four weeks, I'm going to manage as a low tree. If it right. hangs on the, on the tree for several months, mm-hmm. like most citrus and most avocados yep i'm fine with 10 or 12 or 15 foot tree. 15 foot tree but yeah. that's see that's my size that's what yeah i've chosen as manageable for me and it's taken me it's taken me 20 years to settle on those sizes so now that i'm comfortable with it that's kind of what i preach but uh-huh. it's not necessarily what might work for you or right. might it might be something different for your your customers so perfect everybody needs to choose that for themselves yeah when there's a lot of logic behind what you just shared too and, you know, it, 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 a lot of us learn the hard way. Uh, yeah. But, you know, after, I, I tried to manage a, a 15-foot Santa Rosa plum tree many, many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. And I came to the realization that I don't need 400 or 500 plums in a two- or three-week period of time. Right. So, what do you do with them all? Exactly. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, I was uh, bagging them up and taking them to work to give to customers, and the kids were taking them to school. And, mm-hmm. you know, after about a week or 10 days, the neighbors won't even answer the door anymore. So. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of like uh, the, it's, it's, the zucchini problem. It's all a matter of, of crop usable, usable size and a manageable crop. And yeah. I, I'm a lot happier with um, 50 or 75 Santa Rosa plums in two or three-week period. And then 
a variety like Burgundy that comes in right after that, and maybe a variety like Methley or Beauty that comes in before that. Perfect. So I'm staggering my harvest uh, throughout the season with small manageable crops. Cool. So the three concepts of backyard orchard culture, we've talked about successive harvest. We talk about controlling the size. And the third one is? The third one's pretty simple. Yeah. Number one, grow what you like and what you'll use. Mm -hmm. It doesn't uh, make a whole lot of sense to grow varieties that you really don't have a use for. Uh So um, experimentation is good in a limited quantity. So make sure that you understand what you're putting in. Make sure you're going to like it. Make sure your family's going to like it and make sure you're going to have a use for it and then again adaptable varieties to your area you know i wouldn't i would never recommend that somebody in uh montana plant a mango tree and i would never recommend that somebody in in uh, phoenix arizona plant a bing cherry so right uh choosing varieties that are adaptable to your area kind of fall into that same concept grow what you like and what you'll use and what's adaptable uh and proven in your area so i want to ask this question of you why not a big Bing cherry in Phoenix, Arizona? Well, Bing cherries require a fair amount of winter chilling hours, mm-hmm. and winter chilling hours in Phoenix, Arizona could be zero or could be 100 or 150 hours in any given year. Right. And a Bing cherry is going to require 700 hours, mm-hmm. you know, between 32 degrees and 45 degrees between November 1st and, and January 31st. Yeah. Well, you're never going to get that in Phoenix. Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense to even try to grow a variety like that there it's not adapted to that climate that's actually one of the big reasons i started my fruit tree program 17 years ago and interestingly enough it still happens today you can go into most nurseries here in the phoenix metropolitan area and they will sell you a fruit tree that will never make fruit and more often than not it's because of chill hours no, oh, absolutely. In fact, um, I was in Phoenix about three weeks ago, uh-huh. and um, I had a little extra time one afternoon, and I went into one of the large unnamed establishments that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, monitor their storefront like a big box. Uh-huh. And um, I went into the nursery section, and you know what they had in there? Bing cherries and black tartarian cherries. Oh, my gosh. And I thought, what a shame that they would yeah. even bring those in here and, and retail them in Phoenix. Yeah. So, you know, understanding uh, what's right for your area, varieties that are adaptable to your microclimate is extremely important. Really. And working with a knowledgeable nursery professional makes all the difference in the world when it comes to that. Yeah. And there are, we're, we are out there. You just have to go find them. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So fruit trees these days are grafted. Can you tell us about that process and why it's important? Well, there's several reasons for grafting, but probably the most important reason for grafting is so that you get a, a true-to-type tree. You're going to get an exact clone of the parent that the sign wood was taken from. Mm-hmm. So if I want to grow a Washington Naval Orange or a Eureka Lemon or a, or a Rio Red Ruby Grapefruit, and I planted a seed of any one of those trees, mm-hmm. depending on whatever that tree pollinated with, I could get a hybrid that could be virtually worthless or a variety that could take 15 or 20 years before it even flowered and started to set fruit. Uh Where if I'm a tree that's grafted, I'm getting that exact cultivar, and I I know that that tree was grafted from wood off of a producing tree, Mm -hmm. so the amount of time it's going to take for my young tree to begin to produce is going to be somewhere between a year and and three years instead of uh, gambling that it's going to produce in 10 or 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably the most important reason to graft. Another extremely important reason to graft is so that we can grow trees on rootstocks that are adaptable to different mm, climates. Right. Uh, the, yes, let's say Santa Rosa plum, mm-hmm. for example. We talked about that a minute ago. Well, we grow Santa Rosa plum on five different rootstocks. And the reason that we do that is so that we can uh, send trees up to uh, Wyoming that are on uh, St. Julian rootstock that's adaptable to those cold winter climates. Mm-hmm. We can send trees into Phoenix, Arizona on uh, on Nemagard that are adaptable to, to sandy desert soils in a hot climate. We can send trees on Citation up to uh, Sacramento, California, where the soil is is uh, heavy and, and uh, clay type and doesn't drain well, and that Citation rootstock is going to take that heavy soil better. So we're using a diversification of rootstocks for climate and soil adaptability. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So, you, that, you know, those are those are two main reasons for grafting: to great. reproduce the exact cultivar, and then to grow a variety that's adaptable 
to your geography and, and, and your climate. Yeah. You used a word that I want you to explain, Scion? Scion. Scion. Yeah, Scion is, is the, the bud wood or the propagation wood that we would take from a parent tree mm-hmm. and graft into our, our selected rootstock. Got it. So that's the, that's the what's going to make the fruit. That's what's going to make the fruit, exactly. That's, that's coming from the from production cultivar. Mm-hmm. So am I correct in assuming that Santa Rosa plums, given we're talking about them, pretty much all of the Santa Rosa plums came from one original Santa Rosa plum, and it's been budded and grafted all along the way? That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, Luther Burbank was the the hybridizer of Santa Rosa plum, and it was it was over well over 100 years ago. And since then, you know, millions of Santa Rosa plums have been propagated coming from his original source tree. Wow. So, I mean, his original source tree is long since dead. It's been uh-huh. dead for 50 years or more. But, but now that we have progeny that have come from that tree, we can, we can you know, propagate from, from the increase that's come off of his original tree. So all the Santa Rosa plums that are in existence today are, and will ever be in existence are coming from Luther Burbank's original hybrid source. Nice. Do you have any epic grafting stories out there that you could tell us? Well, you know, I, I, I've, I've been involved in, in the fruit tree production now for, for over 35 years, you uh-huh. know, with Laverne Nursery, with Dave Wilson Nursery. And, um, you know, grafting was always something that was uh, very intriguing to me, just the fact that you can take a piece of wood off of one tree and, and surgically, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, implant it into another rootstock and get that tree to grow out and be productive for you. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I did many, many years ago, which was just kind of a, kind of an off the wall, uh, fun thing was we took an old Eureka lemon tree that was in a big old, you know, wooden box and the tree was kind of crooked and it was kind of scarred and it would never really make what I would consider to be a sellable production tree. So mm-hmm. we started to obtain as many different citrus varieties as we could, and we grafted everything we could into that tree. So when we were finished with it, it had about 130 different citrus varieties grafted into that one lemon tree. Oh, so my gosh. It wasn't a lemon. It was, it was everything. It was oranges and mandarins and grapefruits and pomelos and kumquats and limequats and tangelos and, and you name it. Anything in the citrus family was grafted into that tree. So. Wow. It was just kind of a, of a you know, fun, goofy project yeah. that we did uh, at lunchtime. And uh, <laughs> I actually had um, some visitors that came into the nursery that managed a large uh, arboretum in the Midwest, and they really liked that tree, and they bought a lot of neat stuff from me that they were going to plant in a big uh, atrium that they had built at the arboretum, and I gave them that tree. And I understand it's still there today with probably less than half of those grafts on it. Right. But, um, you know, still, still doing well and surviving with 60 or 70 different graphs on it. <laughs> wow. That was epic. That's what I'm talking about. That yeah, was... well, that's just, just a, something that, you know, uh, it's kind of a whimsy thing that a, that a crazy uh, horticulturalist would do uh, <laughs> with an extra at lunchtime, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's talk about shading young trees or shading trees in general. Um, should we shade them, whitewash their trunks? Tell us about that. Well, again, I think that's something that is important depending on your geography mm, and yes. um, where you're coming from. And definitely if I'm in the desert or if I'm in the inland valleys in uh, Southern California or mm-hmm. the San Joaquin Valley in Central California, then shading a young tree is extremely important. You want to prevent that tree from sunburning. And when it comes out of a nursery row, it's grown with hundreds or thousands of other trees around it. And now you've pulled it out of that nursery row where it was being shaded by its brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And now it's out in in the wide open backyard in the full blast of hot sun. And sunburn is the biggest reason that people lose fruit trees in the first year or two years in the ground. So I I don't want to shade the tree itself. I don't want to put an umbrella over the tree. I don't want to shade the foliage. Uh I want to shade the bark and the trunk. I want to prevent any damage to the wooden structure or the growing structure of that tree. Mm -hmm. The foliage, even if the foliage sunburns, new foliage is going to come right away and adapt well. But if you sunburn the main trunk on a tree the first two weeks that it's in your backyard, that tree's pretty much a goner. Uh. So whitewash comes into play. And and when I say whitewash, it doesn't have to be white. 
if you wanted to use any light neutral color uh-huh. uh, up or something like that. I've seen people paint their tree trunks pink. If you want to do that, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, the most important concept is you're, you're now you're shading that young, tender bark and allowing that tree to adapt without being damaged by that hot afternoon sun. So the most important exposure to shade would be the southwest face. That's where the hottest oh, right. afternoon comes into play. Yep. And you want to make sure that you're shading all that young, you know, tender growth the day that you put that fruit tree in the ground. Uh-huh. And whitewash is something you can go to most retail nurseries and purchase what they call tree trunk white. Mm-hmm. I've seen one in Arizona called Arizona Tree Paint, and I think it actually comes in a, in a beige and a white. Oh, interesting. And it's, it's a pretty, you know, it, it's a pretty thick product. Any water-based uh, white, you know, interior type latex paint would work, but... You don't want to use that paint straight. It's pretty, you know, it's, it's a real thick coating if you use it straight. Uh-huh. So we definitely want to make sure that we're cutting it with water. And I would recommend cutting it about two-thirds with water and one-third paint. And then paint over any of that structure that faces to the south-southwest. And that's mm-hmm. going to protect it from that hot afternoon sun. Perfect. What about just wrapping cardboard around it loosely? Uh, that's going to protect the trunk, absolutely, yeah. if you wanted to just put a cardboard sleeve on it. And that's typically what val- uh, growers in the uh, San Joaquin Valley do with young fruit trees, is they'll put a, a cardboard sleeve up to about you know, 20 inches, and then they cut the tree off just above that and, and grow that structure back up. But they're shading that trunk for the first year or two years yeah. in the ground to prevent a sunburn. Now, unfortunately, most people that are buying a nursery tree are getting a structured tree. They're not getting a little with tree where they can cut it off at, at 18 inches and, and grow it back out. They're getting a tree that's a two-year tree instead of a one-year tree, so it already has a structured head uh, growth on it. You know, the, de- the development or structure of the head's already been predetermined. Uh-huh. So that's why it's important on a backyard tree not only to shade that lower portion of the trunk, but to shade some of that scaffold growth that's been developed in the second year. Right. Perfect. So you've... You, you and I have talked a fair amount, and you talk a lot about mulch, mulching around the trees. Why is that important? Well, several reasons. I actually have four, and, and let's, let's discuss them one by one. All right. A good layer of mulch, and in the desert, I'm saying six inches thick, maybe even thicker than that. Uh, uh-huh. A good layer of diverse mulch is going to keep your, your summertime ground temperature an average of 20 degrees cooler mm. than unmulched. So during the summer, when the trees are most active and growing most effectively and efficiently, that's the time when that root structure in in the upper soil is needed the most. And if you're not shading that that top uh, soil layer, you could have temperatures that reach well over 100 degrees in the first few inches of soil, and you could be damaging a a major part of the root system at the time when it's needed most. Mm -hmm. So... A good layer of mulch will take away that summer stress and, and root damage due to excessive soil temperatures. That's extremely important. Uh-huh. Number two, uh, especially right now in California, and, I've, and I've, I preach this in wet years and I preach it in dry years, uh, a good uh, four to six inch layer of mulch will make better use of your irrigation water by 50%. Wow. So uh, if we, uh, we're watering, you know, two or three or four times a week and we put on a good layer of mulch, we theoretically could immediately cut that irrigation time and pattern in half. half. So that's huge. I mean, that's that's saving a valuable natural resource that um, is is stressed in California right now anyway, and it's just making you know efficient use of, of the amount of water that you're putting on, and that's a dollars and cents savings that's easily oh, calculable. Time. Yeah, if I can cut my irrigation on half of my landscape in half by mulching, you know, I could save. 10 15 20 30 40 dollars a month depending on what my irrigation or my water bill is mm-hmm. so you know you could be putting anywhere from a hundred to four or five hundred dollars a year back into your pocket so that that's going to buy your mulch i think oh, that's yeah. extremely important. number three i think uh probably what i would consider the most important reason for mulching is it brings back the the um biodiversity and, and the, the, the living activity to your soil. It increases the mycorrhizal activity. It brings back the beneficial insects and fungi, the earthworms, the, you know, all of those things that help your trees to grow uh, in a more natural manner. They're going to grow with a good mulch layer like they would grow in any forest. Mm-hmm. You know, if you walk out into a forest situation 
and look underneath the, the, the trees and the, and the shrubbery and things uh-huh. that are out there. You've got areas where there's mulch that's built up uh, 12 inches or, or even thicker. Thicker, yeah. I, my wife and I did a, a, a tour years ago with California Avocado Society where we went down to um, Central America, you know, Guatemala, Costa Rica, uh-huh. uh, Panama Canal Zone, areas like that. We toured some really neat um, avocado facilities, you know, new orchards and packing facilities. And we also toured a couple of natural avocado forests. And the first thing I noticed when you walk out into an avocado forest, number one, the trees are uh, giant and spectacular. Oh, I'll bet. They're, you know, 100 feet tall and and bigger around than you and I could reach hands. Wow. And the first thing you notice is you sink up to your knees in that leaf litter. And as you start to peel that leaf litter away Mm. and get down to... There's this beautiful layer about two or three or four inches thick that's just this wonderful black decomposing material. And the roots of the avocado trees are growing right up right out of the that. soil yep. into that mulch layer. And that's where they're taking their nutrients and their irrigation from. Mm-hmm. So, you know, bringing back that, that natural sequence of how trees grow in a, in, a, in a forested or a jungle situation, that's, that's huge. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the right thing for the tree and allowing the tree to grow in a natural form. And, it, and, it, and it's going to help and aid with disease resistance. The mm-hmm. mycorrhizal is going to help with the breaking down of the nutrients and the uptake of the irrigation. And it just makes things grow in, in a manner that, that keeps them healthier in the long run. So, you know, I, I can't think, if, if I was mulching for that reason alone, uh-huh. I would have every bit as aggressive a mulching pattern as I have today. Perfect. There, there's one more reason, and uh-huh. I think it's every bit as important. I'll ask you the question. What do you think is the worst chore in your landscape? <laughs> you mean digging weeds? I mean digging weeds. Yeah. And if you have a, a six-inch layer of mulch, weed seeds are not going to germinate through that. Yeah. So that's, gonna, that's going to eliminate probably somewhere between 75 and 90% of all the weeds that come up in your landscape. Wow. So if I can take the worst chore that you have to do, and, and break it down by, by eliminating 75% plus of it, mm-hmm. wouldn't you be happy? Absolutely. I'm all over that. It's a great reason to mulch right there. You'll still get a few weed seeds that blow in in the wind. You're always yeah. going to get a, a weed that's going to germinate here or there. And people used to tell me, oh, you're going to get uh, all this um, weed seeds are going to come in in your mulch. You know, I've, I never have found that over the years. Yeah. The only places where I had weeds come up are areas where I didn't mulch thick enough. <laughs> so, now, there, there is a, a precaution, uh-huh. and, and I think this is um, something that people need to be well advised on. You uh, would never want to mulch over an uncontrolled, rhizaceous grass like Bermuda grass. Oh, yes. Six inches of mulch over Bermuda grass is, uh, is going to come up like hair on a dog. Yep. So, and all you're going to do is make that root system that's now has a great mulch layer over it. It's going to be stronger than ever, and you'll have a huge trouble... Uh, trying to control that Bermuda. So yeah. if you're going to mulch, control Bermuda grass or rhizaceous grasses before you put your mulch yeah. down. And unfortunately, I found over and over again over the years is that the only way to do that is effectively is to dig it out. So uh, there's there's several different methodologies on that. Some mm-hmm. you know easier than others, but digging out is certainly uh, an option, and it's it's the it's the organic option. Yeah. So let's talk about fertilizing our trees. What's the best way, types? you have a program for that? Thoughts? Yeah, and, and I, I have a lot of different theories on that. I've done a lot of experiments with fertilizers over the years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fertilizer companies have done a lot of experimenting, too. They, they always want to know how we perceive their product and how, you know, how customers um, perceive the, the, you know, the effectiveness of their product. Mm-hmm. So fertilizers in general are made up of three different elements. You've got nitrogen, you've got phosphorus, you've got potash or potassium. Mm-hmm. A lot of fertilizers now are, are also including micronutrients like zinc, iron, and manganese in very, very small percentages. But uh-huh. when we look at, at the basic three elements, and they're the three elements that will be listed on the front of every fertilizer bag, there's always going to be three numbers. Yep. And that references number nitrogen, second number phosphorus, third number potash. So when we look at how these elements react or how plants react to the application of these elements, uh-huh. we know that nitrogen gives us instant gratification. Oh, yes. Nitrogen 
will, uh, if you throw nitrogen on your uh, on your Bermuda grass lawn, you better make sure the mower blades are sharp because you're <laughs> going to be out there cutting Bermuda grass twice a week at that point. Yeah. So the more nitrogen you put on, the more growth you're going to get. The phosphorus and the potash, they're more for uh, promoting a stable root system. They'll also promote um, the uh, production of fruiting and flowering wood. And if you're not promoting fruiting and flowering wood, you're not going to get fruit. So the, uh, the fertilizer companies tend to blend their fertilizers a little bit higher in nitrogen than, than what I like for mature trees. Right. Now, on a young tree, if I'm just putting a tree in the ground this year and the tree's three feet tall or four feet tall, and I know that I ultimately want it structured to seven feet tall or, or whatever my chosen size is, mm-hmm. then I know I've got a couple of years to dedicate to growing that tree and that structure to become a, a fruiting size and fruiting able for me. So at that point, I'm okay with the higher nitrogen. I don't right. mind a, a, a nitrogen that's up in the 10 or 12 or you know, even maybe even higher range number on that bag because I want to grow the tree. I want to promote growth. I want to promote structure. Uh, I, I need to make sure that I'm getting that tree where I want it to be before I really let it start to fruit. So mm-hmm. my first two years are always dedicated to structure. Um, I don't even care if a tree produces fruit in the first two years. In fact, most of the time, the first year, I pick it all off. I'll never let a tree set fruit in the first year because, I, I you know, if you let that young Anna apple tree set a dozen fruit the first year you put it in the ground, mm-hmm. you're going to lose two of your growth potential for that year. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I can go without a dozen apples for the first year, <laughs> yeah. but I don't want to lose that first year emphasis on the de- development of structure. Uh-huh. So a little bit higher nitrogen fertilizer and growing that tree out to a, a structure that I want. Then after the, the full second year that it's been in the ground, it's usually right where I want it. At that point, I'm going to switch gears on fertilizer. I'm going to go to something that is much, much lower in nitrogen and higher in the phosphorus and potash, and I want to make sure that it does contain small trace amounts of the zinc and the iron and the, mm, the, the manganese and yeah. other micronutrients that are, that are good for the area. So that what that's going to do is it's going to give me that root stability, and it's going to promote the development of that flowering wood. And we all know if you, if you don't get the flowers, you don't get the fruit. So first two years a little higher nitrogen. Second, you know, after that, uh, into the second phase, into fruiting phase, mm-hmm. that's when you want to drop that nitrogen level down. So I'm not saying eliminate it completely, but keep it low. Right. You, I want my nitrogen level to be about 25% of what the other two elements are. So mm-hmm. a 3 12, 12 would probably be the blend I'm looking for after that first couple years in the ground, where for the first two years I'd be okay with the opposite. I'd be okay with a 12 3, 3 or, uh-huh. you know, Oh, five seven or something like that in order to get that get that growth and develop that structure now uh, timing also comes into play uh-huh. and this is something that a lot of people don't realize if we're fertilizing at the wrong time of year we're doing a huge disservice to our trees yeah so you want to develop a pattern I call it six months on six months off and what that means is I want to fertilize when the tree is going to need it and use it the most and that's going to be starting in in the uh, mid to late winter where the tree's just about ready to wake up and break dormancy or if it's an evergreen tree it's going to start it didn't go dormant but it shut down for the winter and it's Mm going to start to grow out and flower and do its thing so end of january early february i always put my first application of fertilizer on 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 younger trees i'm probably going to do it again in mid-april and then I'm going to do it one more time about the end of June or right about now, early July. And this is the latest that I want to fertilize because I want that tree to be able to use up the elements that are in the ground, especially whatever nitrogen's in there. So I'm going to give it August, September, October, November to you know use up the elements that are there. And then when wintertime rolls around again, now I've got a tree that has uh, used up most of, of its nitrates. We used up most of the nitrogen in the soil. Uh-huh. And when it's time for the tree to go dormant, the daylight hours are getting shorter, the weather's getting cooler. So those are the, those are the natural elements that are going to promote dormancy. The tree's going to be able to effectively go to sleep for the winter. So November, December, January, I've got a good dormant season. I can develop that, that 90 days of, of, of cooler weather, and I can actually allow the trees to sleep peacefully <laughs> for that night without being interrupted by too much nitrogen. Now, if you go in and you start feeding in September, October, November, 
I always kind of relate that to like the equivalent of going to Starbucks at 11 p.m. <laughs> right. In your uh, venti frappuccino with an extra shot of espresso and then thinking you're going to go home and go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, some people say that caffeine doesn't affect them. If I had that Starbucks at 11 p.m., I better have a five or six hour drive or a 1,200-word article to write, because I'm up for the next six to eight hours. Yeah. So the tree reacts the same. It'll react to nitrogen like we would react to caffeine. So feeding at the wrong time of year is is horrible for that tree. It doesn't allow it to go to sleep in the winter. It doesn't allow it to go into a good, hard dormancy. And, and you know you know what you're like if you don't get a good night's sleep. Oh, yeah. You wake up cranky, and you're not uh, <laughs> doing your job well right. the next day, and you're not as efficient at things as you should be. Exactly the same thing is going to happen to the tree. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's not, it's not going to achieve that, that dormant season that it needs, that, that time of year when it really needs to sleep. So, you know, feeding, so that, following that six months on, six months off, I think is a really important concept. Perfect. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit-chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.